Yes. Right, so I'm, I'm Will Deacon, I work for ARM, uh, and I'm here to talk about memory barriers in the Linux kernel. I'm really surprised so many people showed up, because I mean, people don't like talking about this stuff that much, so thanks for turning up and try and stay here the whole talk. <laughs> so the uh, me memory auditing is a really complicated topic, and I'm not an expert on it. I'm just interested in it, and I'm forced to work with it. Uh, it's lovely because it's different for every architecture, and within a given architecture, people implement different levels of it, right? Um, you can be architecturally compliant by being stricter than what you're, you, you're allowed to do. And most people don't get it, because it's really hard. And this, if you get it wrong, then you get subtle, non-repeatable software bugs, which are the worst kind, okay? <laughs> but, um, particularly on ARM, it's a key contributor to overall, overall system performance. So if you get it right, good. Um, so I'm going to focus on the ARM v7 Linux kernel, so that's 32-bit. Um, there's some new stuff in V8, which you can ask me about in questions if we have time. Uh, from a software perspective, I'm not a hardware guy. Uh, there's one in the audience, so I might uh, deflect questions to him if they come for that. And the ARM arm remains authoritative because this is, this is very much informal. Uh, just trying to try and help people understand it. This is at least where, how I understand it. So we start from this sort of uh, academic point of view, which is this thing called sequential consistency that some of you may have heard of. So Leslie Lamport, another guy you might have heard of, who's said this before I was born. Um, some stuff about multiprocessors and sequential consistency. Now, I'm not going to go through that. You can read the slides. Uh, it's much easier done with the picture. So in this picture, you've got your program up here, right? And I split into three chunks. So chunk A, chunk B, and chunk C. So they're parts of your program. They run consecutively uh, in, in program order, we call that. Now, for sequential consistency, uh, what it says is you, you split that up into three parts. So there's one on processor 0, one on processor 1, one on processor 2. And actually, these are running in parallel, despite the fact that I've staggered it. I just wanted to show where they came from. So they run in parallel, and it says there's an equivalent sequential execution of these instructions, uh, which gives the same result. Okay? So you can think of it as like if, if you've got two chunks running in parallel, you get some arbitrary interleaving, right? which you'd expect. If, if you're running, writing a multi-threaded program, you spawn two threads, you think, well, they're running at the same time. If I haven't got explicit synchronization, got some weird interleaving there. But within, say, processor one, within chunk B, you, kind of, you want those to execute in order. You don't want that processor to start executing all of these things out of order because it's on the same processor. So sequential consistency gives you that guarantee. And the hardware guys hate it because for years on unit processor systems, they played all sorts of tricks on the software guys which we couldn't detect. We didn't know they were doing this to us. So they did out of order execution, speculation, you got store buffers, so you can hit in your own store buffer, you can bypass the store buffer, so your reason writes go out of order, but you can't detect it until you throw another processor in there. It can sit back and go, but you're doing all this out of order. What do you, what do you think you're doing? And once you get that, um, software can detect this. So the hardware guys aren't going to go and fix that for us because then it's back to square one with uh, memory latency unless you throw a lot of hardware resources at this. And um, yeah, I mean, all this was done to try and hide the memory latency because, as you know, processes are getting a lot faster than the memory is. So what we do instead is we define a memory consistency model uh, for each architecture, which says, well, we're not quite sequ sequentially consistent, or in some architectures, we're <laughs> nowhere near sequentially consistent. But here, here's, what we, here's what we do. We define what we can do. Um, so we, we're basically relaxing things from program order. So I've got this sim uh, simple example here. Um, so whenever you see any of these examples, it's always initially A equals B equals zero. You always have that, but I wrote it in there anyway. So things are zero to start with. So you've got two processors, P0 and P1. Um, P0 does A equals 2, and it does B equals 1. P1 is doing C equals B and D equals A. So the, the, the interesting thing is, what does P1 see? Uh, so I've enumerated some of the results there. So, for example, if P1 runs first, so again, back to this uh, interleaving, so P1 could do CD, and then P0 could do AB, and then you'll get 0, 0, right? Because you've, you've read those things before they've been written. Fine. But look at the last case. C equals 1, D equals 0. Now, to get that, one of those guys, or both of those guys, has to execute their instructions backwards. Okay? And that that's, can be done in ARM, and it's not sequentially consistent. All the other, all the other versions are. So I put some, uh, some orderings there on the right of the orders that you'd have to do it. So the issue with the last one is you've done D before C, and uh, that, that's not allowed, because that's not in program order on that one processor. Okay? So things like pthreads and Java, I think they, they give you something approximating uh, sequential consistency. So normally you don't need to worry about this. But for kernel developers, you do. So how do you get around this? Well, the way you get around it 
is the architecture offers you these things called safety nets or fences or barriers, whatever you want to call them. And you can use these to enforce the ordering when you need it, because a lot of the time you don't care about the ordering, it's only in specific cases. And as well as barrier instructions, there are defined dependencies. So often, um, if you load the same address twice, that will happen in order. It's not the case on Itanium, I think, which is really weird. Um, but there are dependencies. And then there are different types of memories, which I don't have time to talk about, but come and find me or shoot me an email. So with that out of the way, uh, I'll talk a bit about what ARM does, and then about, a bit about what Linux does, and then some stuff I wrote which makes it more hard, well, harder to use, but more performant. Um, so to talk about ARM, we need to talk about observers. An observer is, you can think of it as something that, someone that can master memory. So it's uh, somebody who can read from memory, someone who can write to memory. It's not a slave device. So if you're writing to a slave interface on a peripheral, that, that slave is not counted as an observer. And a CPU actually has multiple observers, so it has a instruction fetch, it has the, the D side, it has the table walker, they're all separate observers. And each, each observer sits in something called a shareability domain. So this is ARM terminology, right? So we'll do a bit of that and then I'll show you some pictures because it's much easier with pictures, but we have to do this bit first. So we have, uh, whoa, how many is that? One, two, three, four shareability domains in, in ARM. So we have non-shareable, inner shareable, outer shareable, and full system, okay? And you can use shareability domains to limit the scope of things like cache maintenance, but you, you, it's also a fundamental part of how your system is integrated. You can't change these domains. Someone gives you a system, they go, this is how, these are how the domains are laid out. You have these observers and they, they sit in these domains. And you can have multiple instances of each one. And although it's system specific, and I said defined by, by your SOC, um, there are architectural and Linux expectations. So this is a quote from the ARM ARM, uh, which is, ARM v7 is written with an expectation that all processes using the same OS are in the same inner shareable shareability domain. And we actually, we really, really need that. Because when we do cache cleaning, we broadcast to inner shareable, okay? So you could build something where that's not the case and you won't be able to run a single Linux instance on that. So I've got some pictures to show that. Here we've got four processors, A, B, C, and D, connected up to some memory, and there's a DMA uh, controller down the bottom. So you've got two, three, four, five observers there. Each have their own non-shareable domain. Then I did something wacky, if, please don't build this. Um, I gave two inner shareable domains because I basically want to show you what an outer shareable domain is. <laughs> it's a bit convoluted, but it shows you what it is. So here we have two inner shareable domains. We have A and B in one, and C and D in the other. So you couldn't run a quad-core Linux here, right? You, you could run an instance of Linux there, and another one there, or some other OS, and maybe they could use message passing or something, but it's, it's two, two domains there. And the reason I did that is because, hey, we put them in the same outer shareable domain to so try and draw a distinction there. Maybe someday people will start using these a bit more, but at the moment, that's not used. And then finally, you have the system domain, which basically wraps everything up. So that's, that's the whole thing. It's just whatever's left. So we've got observers. And the reason we define observers in their shareability domains is so I can throw this waffle at you from the arm which I'm not going to recite. I will try and explain it because it's actually fairly intuitive. Doesn't look intuitive, but it, but it is. So first of all, we have to think of a write. So what does it mean for somebody to observe somebody else's write? So an observer does a write, and another observer goes, oh, I've observed that write. Well, it means that if, if the guy who's observed the write does a read, it gets the new value. And it means if it itself does a write, it overwrites the, the write that it just observed, so if you see what I'm saying. It's actually quite intuitive. It's basically some kind of total order on this. And uh, yeah, essentially, I can, I can read it back or I can overwrite it, the, the, the two halves of that. The bit that's a little ha harder to get that I think is that you can also observe reads. And it took me a while to get my head around that because a read doesn't really have a side effect, at least not to normal memory. Um, so what does it mean to observe a read? Well, it means that if I do a subsequent write <laughs> to that same location, I'm not going to affect the value that you read. So if I can still get a write in there, so maybe, maybe your read is is held back somewhere, and I can get my write in under, right, it's into some buffer, and then you get that value. Um, and I haven't yet observed your read, because I can still change the, the, uh, the effect of it. Nearly done with the terminology. So um, we then have global, observa global observability and completion. So uh, a normal memory access is globally observed for a shareability domain when it's observed by all the observers in that domain. So for our previous example, uh, there was that inner shareable domain with A and B, so something would be globally observed within there when both A and B have observed it. 
And this might be a table walk, and if that's complete, then you can say the access is complete. Uh, for the purposes of this, you can probably think of global observability and completeness as being the same kind of thing. Huh. Um, there's maintenance operations as well. I don't have really time to talk about those. Now we're on to the diagram, so hopefully this will help a little bit. Um, <coughs> this isn't supposed to be a circuit diagram. It's not a topology. It's not microarchitecture. It's just a silly diagram that I came up with that I think is helpful for describing this. So we have four uh, processors or observers, masters, whatever. A, B, C, and D. They each have a read and a write channel. Uh, it's one in a shareable domain. And there are these three things which are kind of like buffers, but I don't want to say the word buffer because, again, it's just a silly picture. <laughs> but what you could do is you could have CPU A issues uh, a read and a write. The little a just means that it's from CPU A. It's got nothing to do with the address. Everything here is to a different address. And maybe that read can overtake that write, OK? So when that, if that write hits that buffer, and it's satisfied, then you can, well, when, sorry, when the right hits that buffer, then C will have observed that right, right? Because if C does a read, it'll hit it. Or if it does a write, it can overwrite the value. And the, this, this right from D here can overtake the right from B. Okay, so hopefully you can sort of see where I'm going with this. You can basically, the, the dots can all overtake each other. And they can't overtake each other if there's a dependency between them or at least if it's a specific type of dependency. So I'm going to describe three dependencies and then tell you what, what uh, effects they have. This is good because you can use dependencies instead of memory barriers, and they, they, they cut off to be cheaper. So the first one is the address dependency, which is where the value returned by a read is used to compute the address of the subsequent access. Makes sense. So you, that to be like with your OO language. You load a base pointer for the object, and then you load relative to that to get a member out of the object. There would be an address dependency there. They have to happen in order. They have to be observed in order. And that's handy for things like object creation, because you, as long as the creation of the object is ordered, you don't need a barrier on the read side, unless you're alpha. But we're not alpha, so that's OK. Then there are control dependencies, um, which is where you basically you do a read, and then there's some conditional on that read, and then maybe there's a conditional access after that. Okay. So it's basically like an if statement or something. You load something, check it, and then go and do another access. And then there's this last one, data. This isn't actually in the arm arm, but I think it's worth calling out. But it is in the arm arm, but it's just not called a data dependency. It's just a bullet point. So I call it a data dependency. Um, that's where you read a value, and then you write it somewhere else, maybe even some arithmetic on it. There's a few other rules. Like we don't speculate stores, and again, reads to the same address are ordered. Here's an alpha. I mentioned it a minute ago. Um, <laughs> So here are examples of free. So this is ARM assembly. I kind of assumed you might have some familiar, familiarity with that, but it's, it's not too complicated. So here's your address. You've loaded it. Mask out some bits, and then load based on that. That's guaranteed to be ordered. Control, where we're loading, we're doing compare, conditionally manipulating a value, and then doing a load. That is not ordered, not guaranteed to be ordered. You can speculate that second load before the first one. So control dependency is not enough. If you're relying on cold control dependencies, it won't work. Now, I've worked with old cores that didn't speculate, but it won't anymore. And then the last one's your data one, uh, where you load, add, file to it, and store it back. So that's guaranteed to be ordered. So when you can't use uh, dependencies, you have to use memory barriers. And we have three types in, in R. ISB, DMB, and DSB. I'm not really going to talk much about ISB. Um, can be subtle, but it's not the most interesting one. So we'll talk about DMB and DSB, uh, mainly because they take these options, and that's what the kind of work I've done is based on these options. So DMB ensures the ordering of memory accesses, and DSB ensures the completion of memory accesses. If you stick a DMB in the instruction stream, the instruction stream can continue to be processed, and we just make sure, we basically insert a flag and make sure that things kind of overtake each other. With a DSB, we stall and we stop, and we have to wait for everything to finish before we can proceed with any instruction. I'll show you some pictures in a minute. And the option, can be used to specify the shareability domain. So here we have non-shareable, inner shareable, outer shareable, full system with these handy um, three-letter mnemonics. Our architect was referring to that as NHS the other day. He wanted to get rid of the NHS, <laughs> which is the health system, right? And um, and you can also have an access type, uh, which is stores. Uh, you can only specify either full system or stores. So if that's absent, it's full system. And then you mix these together, so you have things like ISHST for inner shareable stores only, right? which maybe it's a little hard to get your head around. And, and, and I think even GAS accepts different 
ways around, and then it sometimes has op uh, different syntax for these as well, so you can make some really unpronounceable things. But these are the ones we'll stick to. So there's one up there. At B1, we have a DMBISHST, so we'll come to that in a second. But say B writes data equals 42. So you can see B0 there, so write from B. It's traveling along. Great. Red, oh, it's a barrier. And it's a sort of square come rectangle, which means it's a DMB. <laughs> So DMB ISHST, it's out on the right side only. It's a store only. It's inner shareable. Well, this is the inner shareable domain, so it's there. Second right comes through. Now, that is not allowed to overtake. They have to remain ordered. And that's the key part. So as long as that can't overtake that barrier, we're good. And B can continue doing processing here. Here, they've actually switched around, which is a bit of an exaggeration, but it's because they're leaving the inner shareable domain. I just wanted to emphasize the fact that it was inner shareable. So let's go back a little bit to where we just were. So we've issued our data equals 42. We've got our DMB ISHST, and we've got our flag equals valid. So that can't overtake. B2 cannot overtake B0. Now we do a DSB ISHST, and the dreaded egg timer comes at us, right? And we see this uh, diamond, which means DSB for this, this slide. And um, that means that the processor B is now stuck. Can't do anything. And the next instruction is a, a serv, a send event. That's not a memory access, right? But it can't process that event um, until all the pending uh, stores yeah, have been observed in the inner shareable domain. So it's still stuck. Now they've been observed, so it can go and do the serv. So I hope you all followed that. I see a DSB is much more expensive because it's going to stop the, stop the CPU. We also use barriers for maintenance. I kind of, I didn't have this slide originally, but figured if you go back and look at the slides, it might be useful. I don't have time to talk about it. Um, we'll just stick to memory accesses, right? But there are things like cache maintenance and stuff like that, where you can use barriers. You need to use barriers to ensure completeness. It maps OK. It's slightly over. The Power PC has separate barriers for this, I believe. So that's the basic barriers out of the way on ARM. What does Linux do? Well, Linux has loads, actually. And I bracketed. There's lots of brackets on this slide, so it's not too obvious, but I bracketed the ones which we don't need on ARM. So we don't need a rebarried pens, and we don't need an MMYOWB, but nobody uses that one anyway, and rebarried pens are always missing. So we have a compiler barrier. That doesn't actually expand to any code. That's just telling GCC don't reorder things, because GCC also re can reorder the instructions. We have mandatory barriers. We have MB, memory barrier, RMB, read memory barrier, and a WMB, write memory barrier. They're mandatory because they always expand to the relevant barrier. You can use them for I.O. Um, and like the SMP conditional barriers, which are basically just for between CPUs. If you haven't got an SMP kernel, the SMP barriers become compiler barriers. And they also have write, read flavors. On ARM, as you probably have noticed by now, we don't actually have a read barrier. Um, so we have MB and WMB, and then RMB is the same as MB. And there are implicit barriers in some of our constructs. I really recommend you go and read that file. You need to read it about 60 times before you think you understand it. Um, but it's still worth having a look at. It's, it's, it describes a lot of good stuff in there, but it's very low level. It doesn't have any nice pictures. You know? It doesn't have the, the nice read and write channels in different colors. So for ARM, it's the code under ArchArm. We implement the Linux barriers as low level barriers. Okay, So like I just said, the SMP barriers go to DMB. RMB goes to DSB, WMB goes to DSB, um, et cetera, et cetera. And there are low-level barrier macros, so if you want a DMB and you're in some ARM code, you can just call DMB like a function, right? And you get a DMB, you call DSB like a function, you get a DSB. But there's a problem here, which you might have spotted, which is that we don't use any of the options. Everything all accesses full system, right? Which is the worst kind. <laughs> it means that we could get stuck on doing a lot more stuff than we have to. But we kind of got away with it because actually the CPUs didn't do anything with the option either. So it didn't really matter. Until now, uh, when it turns out, when you have lots and lots of cores and people make more intelligent interconnects and that kind of stuff, the, the hints can be quite useful. And I'll show you some well, very hack bench results. I'll show you some stuff I did, which made a difference. So I think that we should code to the architecture and then people are more likely to to implement this as well. Because if, if they look at Linux, go, well, Linux isn't even using this stuff. What's the point in implementing it? So it works both ways. <laughs> so for 3.12, you can now write code as monstrous as this. <laughs> so you can have DSB, and then you can pass in NSHST as a, a string. Well, not a string, just a 
token, and it will give you a DSB NSHS T, right? Um, so this is some code that I added to sort of the TLB flush code, but I haven't talked about maintenance, so it doesn't make much sense. But you can see here it's a non-shareable store only DSB, and then later there's a non-shareable full access. So you might be thinking, oh, I don't really know which barrier to use, let alone which silly option to pass. Well, it's not too bad because I um I've hacked the all the right barriers. So if you call SMP WMB, it will do the right thing for you. Um, and they're actually in, in shareable as well. You need a recent bin utils. I got a lot of uh, flack on the list because if you use a bin utils that's more than three years old, you can't no longer build a V7 kernel. But I really don't care. So tough, just upgrade. Um, or just patch it out. It's your loss. So this is an example, which is uh, the spin unlock code. Now the spin unlock code is a bit uh, special because it uses the low level barriers, right? It's a special hack. It's not using the high level uh, barriers. So you have to go and fix this one up manually, which I've done. So here's the code, which is sort of the weird kernel version of C. And um, before this point, you've got your critical section. So we need an SMP MB to make sure that no accesses leak out of the critical section. Right? You, don't want to, you don't want to unlock and then find that some accesses happen afterwards because that's not safe. So we need a full barrier there for reads and writes because that's when you're accessing your shared data. <laughs> then we've released the lock. We use ticket locks, so you just increment uh, the owner ticket, which is a 16-bit field. And then we wake up the waiting CPUs. Now that means that you need a DSB to make sure that, that the, lock become, the unlock becomes visible right now before we go and wake up the CPU. Otherwise, we may wake up the CPU and it goes there and it can't see the unlock and then it goes back to sleep. <laughs> so for 3.11, that expands to this, which is, as I just said, a DMB SY. Then we've got a half word load, increment it, store it back, full DSB, all accesses, and a send event. Um, the load and the store will be ordered because there's a data dependency there. And that's pretty rubbish code because that first one can be inner shareable and the second one can be inner shareable and stores only because there's a data dependency between the two accesses. That would be sufficient. So for 3.12, we get that code. And that made Hackbench go 5% faster on my like five core development board. Now I've picked the example which made the huge difference, right? Uh, otherwise, this presentation would have sucked. So I changed lots of other things, and it didn't really make any measurable difference. But <laughs> this was a cool one. It was really nice code. I mean, this is a very hot path. Uh, unlocking a spin lock is pure overhead. You're not in the critical section anymore. You just need to release it. Um, but I think that considering how many characters change that is, right, it's not a lot. Um, and it made, it made a big difference. That's a user space benchmark, right? Well, they spend most of its time in a kernel. So now you're all going to go away and... Sorry, Paul? Uh, can I ask you a question? Why sure. weren't they all ISH to begin with? Um, why weren't they all system? Not, not in this path, but in general. <laughs> in general, I... Uh, so you know my comment about bin utils? Bin utils didn't used to accept the options, right? So I guess when someone did the original code, it's like, oh, great, bin utils won't, won't let me do it. Um, and then weirdly, I think they implemented... They, they implemented one option. It was like outer shareable or something first. It was something weird like that, so you still couldn't use it, and it's not useful. <laughs> so that's just its legacy, basically. And also, I suppose, partly lack of understanding. People didn't want to worry about this. It was badly, bad enough having to go through and add the things in the first place, right? And you don't have to worry about that. So before you all go away and make everything non-shareable stores only DMB, or just delete the barriers altogether because you think uh, dependencies are enough, um, <coughs> I can give you some horror stories about I.O. So for I.O., you pretty much always need strong barriers. And if you get it wrong, it's horrible because you get random DMA corruption, which sucks. So here we have DMA to device. So up here, that dotted line is supposed to say, here's an inner shareable cluster of CPUs with the read and write channels down. Then we have a DMA controller over here. So this, let's say it's in the system domain. And the DMA controller is split into two halves because that first one is the slave interface, right? That's not an observer, as I said. So you, you write to the DMA controller and say, please do a DMA, which is actually what we're doing on line A2 uh, in this kind of weird arm assembly I made up. And that will cause the master to go and perform accesses. And I've drawn this as a single line because it's uh, maybe some slow or slower slave bus. It's probably strictly ordered, which is why I drew it like that. Everything just gets funneled down in order. So if you're going to store some data to memory, then you go store to the controller to say, please go read what I just wrote. You're going to want a barrier in there because you don't want to write to the controller before you've written the data to memory. Okay. So what time, does anyone have any idea what barrier you would want? 
Okay. <laughs> so the first thing you might think is, okay, I, I need ST, right? Which is correct because there's two stores and we're ordering stores. So let's try DMB ST, okay? So we can end up in this scenario where our first store to memory gets to here. It goes past this buffer, come bridge, come whatever it, I've decided it is. It's on its way to memory, fine. But the DMA uh, master hasn't observed it yet. Then we've got our DMB ST and then we've got our rights to the control register. But the interesting thing is, that's going to have to fork off, All right? So the barrier, I've kind of drawn the barrier being propagated down both. You probably wouldn't need that because that's an order to interconnect. But the reason you can do that and the reason you don't have to block is because the master, the DMA master, cannot observe A2, right? Can't see it. And neither can the DMA controller because it's not an observer. So now you've got a race. Because um, A0, for some reason, it gets held up in a buffer. I don't know what. Uh, and A2 can reach the controller and then the master can go and read from memory before your writes got there. So what you do instead is you have a DSB ST, and I've, ha I've handily rewritten WMB to do that. So just use WMB whenever you're doing I/O writes like this, okay? And it'll do the right thing. <laughs> and with that, we have to stall the CPU because we have to wait for A0 to be observable in the system domain, which includes the DMA master. So we get stuck waiting for the master to be able to observe it, which means we have to propagate it all the way down to memory before we can issue. Whoops, I don't even have a slide. Okay, before you can issue the write to the controller, so the DSB would work. This is an even worse case, I think. So this is when you want to read back from the device. So you're doing a DMA from the device. So in this case, a little bit more code. Uh, we load from the controller. Now on line A1, we compare, is the DMA done yet? If it's not done, okay, we'll go load from the controller again. So we're just polling the controller. And at some point, it says, yes, I'm done. Then we have a barrier. And then we go and load from memory to see the new data. Now, if you remember, control dependency does not enforce ordering. So control dependency there, who cares? It's not going to do anything. We can speculate that second load from memory. But the only observer, really, you might think, is the CPUs. Uh, it's loads, so we need, four, we need both access types. So let's try DMB again. This, this time, it's got to be right. You know what's coming. So here's the load. Here's the load from the control. Then the CPU goes, well, hey, let's do some speculation. So it doesn't have that load back, so it can't issue the compare. But it can make a guess and predict the branch. It goes, oh, we're not going to go around again. The DMA is done, I think. I don't know, but I think it's going to be done. <laughs> we go, okay, we've got a DMB. Well, we can speculatively execute that as well, because as long as, we, as long as the speculative accesses are in order, that's fine. So then we issue A4 as well. Now, this is starting to look pretty similar to what we had before, which we know doesn't work. Um, what a surprise. Now we're screwed. We're, we're doing the load from the controller. Hasn't got that. We've got a load from memory, and the DMA is just about to finish its write. Okay? Now, you could have a horrible interleaving here where you read the stale data from memory, the write from the DMA finishes, the controller says, yes, I'm done, and the load hits the controller. All right? Now, it's some good timing for that to happen, but if you're doing DMA just like this, which I know many people are, on many devices, you'll hit this problem, and you'll get... I know, the end of your DMA buffer will be corrupt. The interesting part actually here is also, if I go back one, um, if it turned out that the branch, so we do that, we get the wrong value, but then the, the DMA actually says, oh, it wasn't done, right? Then we'd have to discard all of that because you'd do a backwards branch and you'd have to do another load and then the DMB wouldn't have been enough, so we have to throw everything away. So the CPU's okay in that case, it's only this, this particular case where the DMA is finishing. Uh, yes, so the solution, guess what, Let's use DSB, which is in the RMB macro. So again, please use those, those IO, IO barriers when you're doing this kind of stuff. And that'll be enough because the CPU is going to wait for the, the read from the controller to come back before it does anything. So now I've probably confused you to the sense you're thinking, well, which one should I use? It was bad enough when I had just a handful of barriers, and now you're giving me these weird things that I can't pronounce that I can sort of merge with the barriers we already have, and uh, which one? So it's not too bad. I, I've said the really low-level stuff, just so you know what's there. And if you're writing really low-level code, this is the kind of terminology to use. You can come back to the slides. You can email the lists. Good. Just have a think about, maybe I can use a restricted variant. But in general, you should think, do I even need the barrier? Maybe dependencies are enough. In fact, a lot of the time you want barriers, it's when you're publishing to and consuming from other observers. As I said earlier, you could be initializing an object and then reading the object. Well, 
you know, it's, it's a nice simple case of a problem. You can think about that and apply it to lots of other things. You need a barrier on the right, the writer between the two rights, and on the read side, you've got an address dependency. If you only care about CPUs, use the SMP versions. If you only care about reads and writes, then use the specific read or write version. The low level barriers that I've been describing are rarely needed. In fact, you only need them really for non shareable, outer shareable, and maintenance. Um, because these other higher level, higher level um, versions will do the inner shareable ones for you. And non shareable, I think we use in one, maybe two places in Linux. It's not that useful for us. Outer shareable, we don't use at all. And the maintenance code, I already fixed it all. So unless you're adding more maintenance, you should be okay. One interesting thing is the I.O. accesses. So if you go back to the DMA slide, you know, you need these horrible barriers and there's RMBs everywhere. But actually, if you use the MMIO accesses, read-all and write-all, they already have barriers in them because uh, Torvalds got cross and said every architecture has to look like x86, which orders device accesses against normal cacheable accesses. So we put barriers in there. The downside is performance sucks on ARM and power. Um, so we thought, OK, we'll make relaxed versions. So you have read L underscore relaxed, write L underscore relaxed. They don't have barriers. Problem is, Alpha, Titanium, PowerPC, um, MIPS, I think, they also added relaxed accesses, and they all do subtly different things. So if you want to write a, better, a driver that works on the, more than one of these architectures and you want some performance, then uh, you're screwed, because you, it's going to behave ever so slightly differently on these things. I'm really trying to get that fixed, but. No one's interested apart from Ben H, the Pappy C guy, but I think between us, we can sort of deflect enough abuse that we maybe have to get something fixed. Um. So that's it, really. Yeah, any questions? And there's a cake because it's my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there might be a microphone somewhere. I don't know if it works. Yeah, okay. If anyone wants to ask questions. So since we need to read Can you everyone hear Thomas or not? No. Yeah, I, I'm just a That's all right. You can be, ask a stupid question into the yeah. mic. So, since we need to read 60 times the document about memory barriers, can yeah. we have you talk two times in a row? So can you start again? <laughs> I, I could so do the slides out of order. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and by the way, happy birthday. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah, the slides are available. Um, actually, the version I did publish is in a slightly different order. That is deliberate. I'll, I'll fix it. I'll send another version up. So, question from Wolverine. Um, have you experienced in, in the difference write L and write L relax means on, on certain kind of drivers? Because I recently had the issue that I accepted a patch which uh, reused write L relaxed and mm -hmm. later I got a follow up patch to use write L because it was also used on PowerPC. And so, so I have a rough guideline when, when it pays off to use write L relaxed or when to stay safe to just use write L. Yeah, sure. So I'd say for the moment, and I really don't want to say this, but I think I have to to be fair is that um, the relaxed accessors aren't even implemented on all arches. There's no as in generic relaxed accessor. So if you see someone adding a relaxed access to a driver, your best bet and the easiest thing to do is say, is this driver used by more than one architecture? If it is, push back. That's, that's the simple solution. I'm trying to fix this. I, I plan to add, first of all, I have to try and define some semantics. And I have to find someone from x86 who cares enough about this stuff to respond to my email. Then I have to find someone who cares about alpha and get them to agree to the change, make the change uh, across all those architectures. And at that point, you'll be able to use the relaxed variants. And it'll be a well-defined semantic, which is hopefully documented in the documentation. At the moment, under documentation, there are two different definitions of relaxed. And one of them is completely insane, and the other one's really vague. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for, for now, I, I tend to be conservative and, and think that right L relax to reduce them on, on really hot hot path because mm -hmm. even if there's no, uh, the core is not used on PowerPC now, it might be in the future and it so seems I, to me, un unless, that, unless that is sorted out, it seems to me a safer way to do it, like being conservative, is that okay, do you agree or? By conservative, do you mean accepting or rejecting the patch? Uh, only accepting right L relaxed in hot path in, in one where I can really see, okay, the, the performance is critical here. Again, it, it's tricky because I, my last look at the x86 code for this was that the relaxed version doesn't even have a compiler barrier. So if you have two right L relaxed to different addresses, like GCC you could swap them around on uh, x86. This is my last reading of the code. It may have changed. But that's 
different to every other architecture. So on ARM, those two Rytel Relax will hit the device, same device, but different address, in order, which is normally what you want. Um, but if meanwhile you were populating some DMA buffer, like in my examples, uh, they wouldn't be ordered against that. So there's, there's the issue of we want to maintain order to the device with a relaxed accessor, but we don't care about ordering with respect to sort of random normal cacheable buffers. Um, because actually normally you don't. If you're, if you're, if you're programming 64 device control registers, right? You don't care whether that's out of order with respect to random cacheable buffers. You just want them to be in order with each other. And you might not even care about that, but I think that's something that you, you may want, particularly if the last one is enable. <laughs> <laughs> so um, for that, the relaxed accessor would be enough on everything apart from x86, from what I can tell. So it's really your call. I, I would say that if the driver is going to run on more than one architecture, or if it's just ARM and ARM64, because they have the same semantic for this, uh, then at least question the use of it. Because people might not realize. They might have just added it and found that it went faster and not checked that it didn't need that data. Yeah, do you want to pass the mic forward to Paul? For the DMA from device slide, I wonder yep. if you could bring that one up. I sure. think that, okay. at least for many SOCs, the, it, it might actually be a... Which one do you want? Uh, the last DMA from device. I think it's this one. I think one. it's this one, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, this one might actually also need an <coughs> MMIO barrier from the, on the inter, in, in terms of the interconnect. Like it might need a readback from that yeah, DMA so it, controller. It, it, it would on OMAP, I think. So. Okay. It depends yeah. on what, what you want from here. Uh, we do have, not in our RMB, but in our WMB, we have things like you go and poke the outer cache controller on A9 because barriers aren't propagated and things like that. So that's another reason actually to try and use the accessor, I think. Put but, but this is even in terms of the, the interconnect, it's beyond the scope of the, the ARM, the, the, so what the ARM do, has control do, over okay, basically. So how, do you do, how do you do DMA on the OMAP? Well, Slowly. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about this particular case, but I yeah. know that for many of our device drivers, we just used raw, read, raw write L and yeah. raw read L. And then what, what we often had to do, particularly for interrupt handling, is that we had to do readbacks <laughs> to avoid like yeah. spurious IRQs and things yeah, like sure. that. Sure, and I mean, so. that's, that's a one of the things with the ARM architecture is we have the architecture, but people can bolt on other things which just behave weirdly and or different than what you'd expect. So I mean, this is this is a good way of thinking about the problem, though. I mean, we could, for example, take uh, what you just described and add it to this diagram somehow. But yeah, I think it's bad enough as it is. <laughs> yep. Question at the back. Oh, okay. You come forward. Uh, for your DMA examples. Yep. Um, if you use the coherent DMA uh, that only handles caches, so you have to enforce ordering anyway mm -hmm. using these barriers. If you use the streaming DMA and you put those DMA sync, mm -hmm. uh, single or SG for device and so on, does it include these barriers or you have to add them anyway? Do you remember? Oh, I'm just trying to have a think. The DMA, the streaming DMA API will do the right thing. So you don't need them barriers? No, if you're using the streaming, so I mean you wouldn't write, uh, I mean no one writes DMA in assembly code for a startup, so you, you wouldn't go and write this. this, this no. right. You'd use the streaming DMA API, but within the DMA API we, we will do the right thing. It's just, I think it's good to have an appreciation for how it's working though, um, particularly if, I don't know, if anyone here after this talk has thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go back, I'm going to hack DMA mapping.c and make it all non-shareable. Please don't. <laughs> it's like that for a reason. <laughs> Okay, no more questions. Well, if you have any, if you do think of anything or you want to have a look at the slides, they're on the web and you can email me or come on the list and shout DMA stuff. So, thank you very much.